Hey guys, thanks for checking out this clip of Anatomy of the Church and State. Be sure to catch the full episode on Rumble or ChristiansForLiberty.com. Links are in the show description. Let's start from the beginning, Roger. Why don't you tell us about your journey to Jesus? How and uh, when did you become a believer? Well, the Reader's Digest version, Jeremiah, I uh, I grew up in a, in a broken home. Uh, you know, I was a Marine, you know, back in the 60s, and uh, we don't, we you know, we weren't taught a lot of big words, and I didn't know dysfunction, you know, what it meant until I looked it up in a dictionary and it was a picture of our family. Uh, you know, I broken home. My dad left my mother uh, when my twin brother and I were four. My baby brother was four months old. After that, my mom left. My brother and I uh, took my younger brother, went to the West Coast, I, I believe, and uh, was gone for two years. We were in an orphanage for six months. Then my grandparents got custody of us. Two years later, my mom came back, remarried my stepdad, and we had that blended family, you know. Uh, my mom had kids, my stepdad had kids, had kids together, so we had all that. And, uh, you know, it was just a, a dysfunction. My my mom was still an alcoholic, but my dad was kind of a workaholic. He had to work two jobs to support this blended family. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so I just grew up in a dysfunctional home and uh, from high school. Now, you know, my brother and I are identical. Uh, you know, we, our wives, obviously we've been married. My wife and I have been married over 50, uh, 50 years. And so is my twin brother and his wife. And, uh, so they don't get us mixed up, but people, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I flew into Houston and while my wife went to the bathroom, uh, before we went to get baggage, some woman come across the, the hallway and gave me a big hug. And you now she goes to my brother's church. So, so even though we were identical growing up, my mother used to look at me and, um, she wouldn't start drinking until my dad would go to work at night on his second job after dinner. And she would look at me and she'd say, you know something, Rod, you're never going to amount to anything. You're going to be a bum just like your real dad. And, uh, you know, I heard that for probably 10 years, you know, from the time, uh, actually longer than that, from the time I was six years old until I graduated from high school. And, uh, you know, my brother and I joined the Marine Corps right out of high school. Uh, back 1965, you know, Vietnam was just getting started. You really didn't hear a whole lot about it. Uh, I joined in, I think, April, went uh, in June, right after graduation. And, um, uh, you know, once we got to basic training, you know, we kind of pretty had a pretty good idea that Vietnam was going to be our next destination. You know, it's, uh, Jeremy, in 65, there was still this notion that freedom, that America was was a good country, and, you know, we fought for freedom. I had, uh, you know, my real dad and stepdad both served in World War II. Uh, I know nothing about their service. Uh, I had two uncles that served in Korea. And so, you know, we still believed in fighting, you know, to, to free other people. And, and uh, you know, the logic back then is that we wanted, we wanted to avoid a domino effect, you know. And it's kind of interesting that, you know, Korea – uh, kind of set the stage, uh, the Korean War set the stage for the Vietnam War. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, both countries are divided in half. North going to be communist, South going to be free. And, um, uh, you know, so, and then the Viet Minh, which was the forerunner of the Viet Cong, started their uh, guerrilla warfare strategy to take over the whole country. So it was really starting to, to really get heavy in 65, you know, when I, when I joined there. So three tours, I, I, you know, my stepdad would take us to a church, but it was a traditional church, didn't know anything about Jesus, didn't know anything about, um, you know, having a personal relationship, just, you know, be a good person, go to church. And, uh, you know, after Vietnam, uh, you know, I lost a lot of friends. Uh, in fact, I realized years later that the, the reason I went back, I did my first two tours back to back. I was in the States for a while. And, um, you know, uh there was one one night where we walked into an ambush where, uh, I mean, everybody in front of me, I was normally the point, but I got into an argument with our new squad leader and he kind of put me in the back and we walked into an ambush and, you know, the 10 guys in front of me died uh, on the trail. Myself and two other Marines were blown off the trail by a, a, a mine. And uh, the two guys behind me were wounded severely. I didn't have any wounds. I had holes in my fatigues, you know, from shrapnel, but not not a scratch. And uh, lay there in the rice paddy watching the Viet Cong come out from the jungle, kill anybody that was still alive, take their equipment. I'm in less than two minutes, disappeared back into the jungle. And, uh, you know, I've 
found the radio call for evacuation. They, they came, they took the two wounded guys, and then they put the 10 dead Marines on a helicopter with me, took me back to the rear area. The next morning, uh, I heard that they, the two guys had died on the way to the hospital. Mm-hmm. And so I carried that guilt for, for years. And then, uh, you know, when I came back in the States, I was a drill instructor for a while. I was a, a criminal investigation division investigator. And three years later, you know, I just got America had changed radically than the country I knew in 1965. By 1970, it to us as veterans, it appeared that our, our nation was ashamed of us, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, when I came back in 67, we were embarrassed, you know, by the Vietnam War. Now, there, I mean, there were peace protesters, you know, that wanted to kill you for peace. And when I put my uniform on, you know, I'm confronted with these protesters. And, and I knew that if I did something, you know, somebody threatened me. And if I did something, I would be the one getting in trouble. And so I felt like, you know, this wasn't even my home anymore. And as a Marine, I felt more welcome amongst my fellow Marines 12,000 miles away than I did in my own home. Mm. But when I got wounded and I was laying in the hospital bed and heard the doctor, my, my brother got there six days later, he was out in a recon patrol. And when he got back, the, his CO said, you need to get to the hospital in Da Nang. And uh, uh, so when the, he came in and was looking for me, had walked past me, I heard uh, a doctor tell him that I was going to die and that there was nothing else they had done. I had a grenade go off my feet, was shot twice, bayoneted, I burned by phosphorus, and he didn't even recognize me. My body was so uh, torn apart. And so I was 22 years old, and when I heard that, you know, I mean, I felt, Jim, I felt a fear inside grip me that was greater than anything at three tours of combat. And I said, God, if there really is a God, if you let me live, I'll do anything you want. And I fell asleep. And a uh, long process in the hospital it was a week and a half later before they felt like I was strong enough to, you know, to, to be uh, medevac. And uh, on the way home, I started bleeding internally. So they took me off the plane in uh, Yokushka, Japan. And I had, uh, you know, five surgeries, uh, I think, in, in a, or eight surgeries in five weeks. Finally got back, Great Lakes Naval Hospital. And, um, you know, when I got out of the hospital, I was a Marine. I thought, you know, when the going gets tough, tough get going. And, and uh, hoorah, I, I did it. And yet, you know, on the outside, I looked okay. But inside, every night I was dying, you know. Uh, we we didn't talk about PTSD. I don't think I really even heard that much about PTSD other than what the VA said. You know, we can medicate you, which did not sound good to me. My biggest fear in all those months in the hospital was getting addicted. You know, and uh, so uh, they said we can medicate you or we can counsel you, but we really can't help you. So that leaves a person with a sense of hopelessness. And so I relived Vietnam every single night for four and a half years. And uh, I tried to, you know, uh, the thing I said I would never do, you know, because both my real parents were alcoholics as I became an alcoholic and a workaholic, the very thing that I had hated. And uh, we had been, my wife and I, I met her, uh, uh, convinced her I was normal. And, uh, uh, and, and neither one of us were knew Christ. And we uh, were married for two years. And, uh, you know, when I got married, I thought I wanted to be a good husband. You know, I wanted to, to be, but I had no example, no role model of what that looked like. And, you know, I thought my wife would make me happy. Uh, unfortunately, my wife thought I was supposed to make her happy. So we had two people that were not happy. And uh, I, I uh, violated my, my wedding vows. Uh, my wife found out. And, uh, you know, just after our second anniversary, we split up. But we had started going to this church. And, uh, you know, these people in this traditional church had something that we did not have. And, uh, and we knew that, I guess it even made us feel even more guilty, more wearing the mask. And, um, we split up and, uh, we, we decided to get together, I think about 10 days after, about, you know, we wanted to be friends, you know, have our divorce be amicable, whatever that means. <laughs> and, um, uh, my wife looked at me and she said, you know, uh, unless we put God first in our life, we're not going to make it. It was like something inside just clicked. So we went to her apartment. Um, it was nicer than the trailer that I was living in. And uh, 
uh, we just knelt by the bed and I just cried. I said, God, I don't know what's uh, what's missing. And, you know, the scripture calls it that still small voice of the Holy, uh, the Holy Spirit. It says, Rod, surely it's not what's missing. It's who's missing. You need Jesus. And, you know, I, I probably didn't do it right. You know, I just cried. I said, God, if you can use somebody like me, you know, here I am. And Jeremiah, that night, you know, uh, every morning, emotionally, I felt like I put on 100 pounds of emotional combat gear that I drug around. You know, the memory of my friends, uh, the pain, the suffering I saw, the, what, what the Vietnamese people went through. And I carried that around every single day. And when I said that prayer, it was like a weight fell away. And all that emotional baggage. Uh, just fell away. And that night when I went to bed for the first time in four and a half years, the nightmares of Vietnam stopped forever. Now I'm still a piece of work. And so it took, it took a, took a while. And then at the church, I began to find out what exactly I had done. You know, what, what, how God had, had come into my life and, and had, we had couples that took us under their wing and began to disciple us. And, uh, so that, that's, that changed my life. And, uh, you know, I was a uh, at that time district manager for Pinkerton Detective Agency in in Omaha, Nebraska, and we were working with kids off the street for about three years. And and uh, uh, 1978, I left my job, and we began starting Teen Challenge Centers across Nebraska. And, I would, and it just kind of goes on and on from there. But uh, actually, that's the Reader's Digest version. 